Okay, Bob, off you go. Okay. Once again, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to get to our guest speaker, Marilyn Simmons, in just a moment, but first you got to wade through a bit of the boring club business. Um, tonight we actually have some exciting breaking news. Um, the Field Nats, Midland Penitentiary Field, Field Nats, nominated our own Kate Harries for the Severn Sound Environmental Sustainability and Stewardship Champion Award presented by the SSEA. And just this afternoon, just not too long before uh, this meeting, I learned that Kate has been successful. And she's been chosen to, to receive this award. It recognizes individuals who has demonstrated outstanding leadership, creativity, and innovation in forging sustainability in the Severn Sound watershed and ecosystem. The thing is, Kate doesn't know she won this yet. I tried to phone her, but she is in Europe and I can't get through to her on the phone. I emailed her, but so she hasn't, she hasn't got the news. So you're all in the unique position of knowing this before Kate does. But anybody who knows Kate knows that she really is a leader in this. She really is a champion and she deserves this award, award more than anybody I can think of. Her major focus recently has been on the invasive species in Tiny Marsh. Um, in particular, she's the, the driving force be, behind the Frag Free Tiny Marsh Initiative, um, where we've been, it's a three-year project to try and address some of the problems created by this invasive reed. Um, I won't bore you with all the details, but Suffice it to say, it, it's, it's been a major effort of, of Kate Spartan. Kate's always been an inspiration to me, and uh, I'm really pleased that she's being recognized this way. She, she really deserves it. Um, as you know, probably from her business and, and her life, she's been a champion for native species and, and big, big trouble for invasive species. And We wish her all the best, and I, I want to say if you're Looking at this, or you're somehow seeing the recording, congratulations, Kate, you deserve it. Um, Kate emailed me a little while ago, and she wants to remind everybody that MTM conservation memberships have to be in place before March 31st in order to vote at our AGM. Well, we haven't set a date for the AGM yet, but still there is this deadline. Um, Uh, we encourage people to join, but not just join. We'd like to get you out to the AGM where you can you can make a statement and, and stand up for causes that environmentalists and, and naturalists believe in. So we've had a few little glitches uh, at MTM. Our, our treasurer resigned, as did our membership coordinator. So things are in a bit of a mess. But we're exploring ways of uh, working past that, and hopefully we can automate this through a, through a service, an online service. Uh, if anybody's waiting for your taxable receipt for your MTM membership, all I can say is, sorry, we're working on it. We'll hope you get it out before the tax deadline. Um, apart from that, she wanted me to remind everyone that David Hawk is looking for volunteers to help control uh, invasive Phragmites. And if you look at the chat, I did put in David Hawk's email address. It's vol for volunteer at mtmconservation.org. And you email that number and or that, uh, that email address and uh, David Hawk will provide you with all the details if you're interested in volunteering at all. And I really encourage you to do so. Uh, this year, Kate's uh, putting in place a, a, a new approach to dealing with the invasive garlic mustard. In the past, we used to have organized uh, garlic mustard polls, and uh, we'd bag up all the, uh, the the garlic mustard and truck it off to a landfill or to be composted offsite. Um, this year, we're going to compost the, the the garlic mustard right on site. Uh, this has several benefits. Obviously, we don't have to truck it, um, and it'll allow volunteers to go in and work anytime. That they choose whatever suits them if, if you're a midnight midnight garlic mustard puller well then um, this is for you you can go in there with your flashlight and 
oh, garlic mustard all night long and just leave it in the compost pile. There's also going to be a QR code there with information on what to do. And Kate also reminds us that the big poll will be Saturday, April 8th, 10 to noon. And that's an organized event to promote awareness of, of the problem of garlic mustard. Um, this year, something new has been added. Uh, MTM will have a salamander project led by David Cowell, who I believe is a member of uh, the MPFN. Are you, are you there, David? Eh, I don't know. <clears throat> My own uh, project there is the, the bluebird trails that I'm, I'm trying to establish. Um, we've nailed down a date for the Elmville High School students to come out two afternoons in April. April 3rd and April 6th in the afternoon. And I'm gonna give them the task of uh, pounding these uh, metal poles in the ground and then mounting some of these bluebird boxes on them. We have uh, 50 bluebird houses ready to go. Actually, we have more than 50, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold the line at 50 for now. We'll, we'll get the posts installed and hopefully we can establish, um, I don't know, I think it's the first ever Midland Penetanguachene Field Naturalist Bluebird Trails at Tiny Marsh. And uh, I'm hoping just to see bluebirds at Tiny Marsh. That would, that would be a, a, enough of a victory for me. Okay, we're nearly done. Um, one last item is I want to remind everybody that our next meeting won't be online. It will be in person at the Y Marsh on April 20th. And the speaker will be Dale. I hope I'm saying this right. Lead beater or lead beater, anyway, on the flora of Kawartha Lake. So you'll all want to come out and join us for that. And I'm um, sure you're tired of hearing from me. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken now to introduce our speaker, Marilyn Simmons. Over to you, Ken. Thanks, Bob. Let me just um, find, I'm going to find Marilyn and put a spotlight on her. Just a second. Well, there's Marilyn, and I think you got your mic on, Marilyn, do you? I do. <laughs> okay, I'm just uh, pin myself here, too. So, welcome, Marilyn. Um, I'm excited uh, about this, uh, about meeting Marilyn, because um, the, our Naturalist Club has a has a nature book club. Every We've been doing for about 20 years now. We've been getting together once a month and reading wonderful nature books, and Three of, I guess it's about five or six months ago, we all read Marilyn's book together. And this book club, we're up to about uh, two, we've almost read almost 200 nature books now over the wow. many years. At, wow. uh, you know, 12, 12 books, so one book a month. Uh, but a lot. And of those almost 200 books, I think everyone in the club agreed that Marilyn was one of the most interesting, uh, just an amazing story about an amazing woman. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Marilyn before we turn it over to her. Uh, Marilyn was born in Winnipeg, but she spent her childhood in Brazil. Uh, she's the author of 20 books, including the one we're discussing tonight, Woman Watching. Her nonfiction book, The Convict Lover in 1996 was a finalist for the Governor General's Award. And in 2017, Project Bookmark Canada installed a plaque on the site of the former Kingston Penitentiary Rock Quarry to honor the place where the convict lover, her book took place. And uh, maybe people know, we have one of these project bookmark plaques in Midland at Little Lake. It's commemorating a book called The Queen of Unforgetting by an author named Sylvia Maltosh Warsh. Uh, and her book took place in Midland. So uh, Marilyn writes in a wide variety of genres, personal essay, memoir, travel, travel, literary fiction, and creative nonfiction. She is the founder and first artistic director of the Kingston Writers Fest and is an influential champion of writers and writing. She lives with writer and translator Wayne Grady, who also writes some wonderful books, and divides her time between Kingston, Ontario. But tonight she's coming to us from her winter home in San Miguel de, de Allende, Mexico. So over to you, Marilyn. Take us away and, and tell us a story. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. It was so great listening to Robert too about, you know, I mean, bluebirds, garlic mustard. I feel like I'm right back in Ontario. 
uh, which I will be soon. It's very nice to be here with uh, with all of you at the Midland Pentatang Mission Field Naturals. I am so amazed and surprised to see such such a broad uh, band of locations uh, that people are coming from in the in the chat. That's really terrific. Um, and I just have to tell you that the bird migration has started here. We have lots and lots of birds coming through central Mexico, and I know that they're on their way to you. So um, yeah, the songbirds will be there soon. This evening, I'm gonna talk a bit about Louise de Caroline Lawrence's background, what led her to Canada, what led her to the birds. Um, it's illustrated with photographs from her incredible archive, 26 bankers boxes full at Library and Archives Canada alone. Um, oh, are you, are you getting me there okay? Oh my God, I seem to be flashing before your eyes. Um, I just kind of noticed that my internet is unstable. I hope that that's not going to be a problem. Not a problem so far. Okay, good. Okay, from my end, I, I'm looking very strange, but I'm just going to ignore me and look at you with the owl on your head. Yeah, uh, we have a uh, <laughs> Hi. Is everybody uh, seeing Marilyn okay? Oh, I see you. We've got uh, uh, Kathy. As I'm going to turn Kathy's camera off again because it's flickering. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to turn the PowerPoint on now, and it just takes a little minute. So if you can just uh, be a little, whoops, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Can I you have to uh, the button there? Yeah. Can you allow me in? Thank you. Okay, I'll just wait for a minute until just that happens. a second, happens. I hit the right button. Okay. <laughs> Should be okay now. Okay, I'm glad everybody is patient. Oh yes, there it is, we're all fine. Okay, the slides are preparing to come on. They will be there shortly. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, her background, and I'm going to talk about how she came to birding, and uh, I'm going to read a little bit from, from the book, and I hope you can see me now. I'm at the bottom of the screen. Hi. Everything looks, everything looks good. Okay, that's great. Um, so it was a very strange and winding road that brought Louise to the log cabin uh, on the shores of Pimacy Bay, where she was going to end up studying birds for half a century. Louise was born into Swedish aristocracy. Her father was Chamberlain of the court of Gustav V. Her godmother was the Queen of Denmark. Um, and she was raised on a vast family estate on the Baltic Sea, south of Stockholm, called Svenskund. And this was a mecca for conservation as her father and his friends actually created the world's second conservation area in the late 19th century. Yellowstone National Park was the first, as you probably know. The second was on Carlso Island in the Baltic Sea. And that island was famous for its colonies of guillemots and razorbill ox, um, but they were being threatened with extinction uh, from hunting and from egg gathering. So uh, her father and his friends bought up the entire island and turned it into a conservation area. Louise was really close to her father. She helped him set up feeding stations every fall outside their dining room window. He took her on his bird watching rambles. He taught her the names of the birds and all their calls. And her, her favorite thing was to curl up on the bearskin rub at his feet and listen in on his conversations with all the great Swedish naturalists and nature painters of the day who would come to Svenskund to visit. Louise was the eldest of two daughters, and so she expected to inherit Svenskund. She was 17. She was just learning the ropes of managing the estate when her father died suddenly, and the estate had to be sold for debts. And that forced Louise to move with her mother and her sister into a small apartment in the city of Stockholm. Even so, uh, they remained part of the aristocratic uh, elite of Sweden. And in 1912, she debuted uh, in the court of King Gustav. She was a very lovely, tall young woman, but she was also a very headstrong young woman, highly principled. And when the First World War broke out, 
she turned her back on all that privilege and trained as a Red Cross nurse, somewhat to the consternation of her mother. Uh, she was posted to a Russian POW camp on the border of Denmark, and there she fell in love with a white Russian officer named Gleb Kirilin Nikolaevich. And that is Gleb right above my head. Gleb and Louise married, and Louise followed him to Archangel in the Russian Arctic, where the white Russians were fighting the Bolsheviks in the last days of the Russian Civil War. Uh, the white Russians were defeated, as we know, and Louise and Gleb joined more than a thousand sleigh loads of soldiers and refugees that were racing across the landscape in the middle of February, in the middle of blizzards, trying desperately to get to the border of Finland and to freedom. Uh, if you've seen Dr. Zhivago, um, that, that movie was really part of Louise's actual life. Louise and Gleb didn't make it. They were captured. They were sent to a Bolshevik prison in Moscow, and Gleb disappeared there. So Louise stayed on for another four years. She worked as a nurse, uh, nursing through the famines in the Volga, the, the famines that followed the revolution and the Civil War. And all the time she was searching for news of her husband, but discovered nothing. So Gleb and Louise had always planned on emigrating to Canada uh, because Canada was most like Sweden and Russia, but without the politics, because Sweden and Russia have had a mad on for centuries, something like you know England and France. In 1926, Louise to, uh, decided to emigrate on her own. And she landed in Bonfield, Ontario, which I'm sure all of you know. I gave I gave a talk um, a week ago today to Vermont, and I had to have maps to explain where Bonfield was. But I'm pretty sure you know where Bonfield is, just north of Algonquin Park. And there she set up one of the first Red Cross outpost hospitals. Now that that was a, a new experiment in Canadian healthcare, and it was it was really quite revolutionary. The community would donate a house that would become a clinic. And the Red Cross would donate a nurse to become staff, and that nurse would work with a doctor who was usually at some distance. And the health care then would be provided free to the community. So Louise's territory stretched over 2,500 square kilometers and included 2,000 school children and their families scattered through, you know, across the forest. She visited them in summer on her Model T Ford, which is there on your left. Um, she named her car Henrietta, and she traveled by dog sled in the winter. So she, she, I'll move over. She, she bought the dog. She trained the dogs with the help of a local. She learned how to mush, and that's how she traveled to her clients in winter, which gives you an idea of the kind of resourceful and determined and um, physical person that she was. So among Louise's mothers, the, the women that she looked after, was Elzir Dion, who gave birth to the first quintuplets in the world to survive more than a day. Louise became nurse in charge of the quints for their first year. She brought them successfully through that really um, treacherous time uh, on her own personal formula, which is kind of a Swedish formula, of fresh air, sunshine, and soap. Even in the middle of winter, when it was minus 30, 35, minus 40, she had those babies outside, uh, you know, snuggled up that for their one hour of fresh air a day. But if you know anything about the quits, you know it was it was an absolute media circus. Um, and uh, the the province, after one year, in their wisdom, decided to keep guardianship of those uh, young babies until they were 18, Louise was against that. She felt that they should have been returned to their families at that point, because by then their chance of survival was the same as any child in Canada at the time. So she, she left the quints and she retreated to a piece of wilderness that she found on one of her excursions by dog sled exactly 90 years ago this winter and where she had hired a pair of Finnish carpenters to build her a three-room log cabin. So Louise was 40 when she uh, when the quintuplets were born, and she was 41 when she uh, left the girls in the care of others and re retreated to this log cabin. 
and the map on your on your left shows where see i can't get my hands right no this hand <laughs> and then it disappears um the map on your left has an arrow where Pimacy Bay is, which is is almost exactly halfway between the village of Mattawa and the town of North Bay and just down the road from the very, very tiny village of Brother Glen. So Louise always saw that time with the quintuplets as a kind of intermezzo, a separate and unrelated episode that propelled her back to the life she thought she'd started out to live, which was a life in nature. But when I look at it from a further remove, I see a single repeating refrain with Louise. Louise watching the birds in the forest of Sweden. Louise watching those tiny babies, keeping them alive. Louise watching birds on Pimacy Bay. Wherever she was, Louise was watching. So I'm going to read an excerpt now from a chapter in the book. This is the, that's the book um, from a chapter called This Gentle Art. And that was a phrase used by Percy Taverner, who was the Dominion Ornithologist at the National Museum of Natural Sciences in Ottawa. He was the author of Birds in Canada. And in one of his letters to Louise, he used that phrase to describe the study of birds, this gentle art. So this is from the book. On a cold day in April 1945, not too distant from right now, Louise de Caroline Lawrence hiked four kilometers through dense forest to a bushy white spruce where Canada jays had woven dry sticks between a fork of branches, creating a frame for the bowl they'd shaped from last year's oak leaves, bits of wasp nests, and tent caterpillar cocoon. Inside, five eggs, beautifully white and spotted with olive brown, lay with their small ends neatly turned into the bottom of the well-insulated nest. At the time, almost nothing was known about the species that is now Canada's national bird. A gregarious creature in summer and spring, it is shy about raising its young, retreating into the boreal wilderness as early as February, in the same way that Louise had retreated to her patch of forest on the Mattawa River. When Louise told a scientist at the National Museum in Ottawa about the Canada Jay nest, he urged her to learn as much as she could about their nesting habits. Thus, she wrote, armed with watch, mirror, and a blanket, how I wish I had thought of a ground sheet to that day because the best spot for observation happened to be all but in a little stream. I set out on my first nest watching expedition with no previous experience, but much enthusiasm. The clouds hung low, pushed swiftly by a wind from the northeast. The temperature hovered just above, just below, freezing. Louise set up a flat trap baited with suet, and she settled on a stump within sight of the nest, holding the blanket close and sitting perfectly still, hoping the jays would accept her as part of the landscape. She smeared a nearby stick with peanut butter. The jays flew in, swallowed the peanut butter with a soft shre and flew back to their eggs, ignoring the trap. Without holding the bird in her hand, Louise couldn't distinguish male from female. Both were dark gray above, lighter gray below, a distinctive white patch on the forehead and black at the back of the head. She assumed she was watching a mated pair. Uttering mellow notes, she wrote, they stepped around the nest and over it, apparently undecided which one of them ought to sit down on it. In growing excitement, both crouched and shivered their wings until finally one of them entered the nest and sat down on the eggs, carefully adjusting them under its brood spot. The other followed and sat down on top of the first bird, their bodies slightly crosswise. The one covering the eggs, with only its head and tail showing, was embedded deeply under the long, fluffed feathers of the one on top. For an hour and a half, the birds sat on the eggs, stacked like a double duvet. Heavy snow began to fall, then the wind picked up and Louise left, afraid she wouldn't be able to see to find her way home. She had sat by the nest for six hours. The blizzard raged all the next day. In the afternoon, Louise waded back to her watching post. Snow was piling on the top bird so thickly that now and then it had to get up and shake the snow off, strutting around as if trying to warm. 
Louise lasted four hours. On the fifth day of watching, Louise arrived just before sunrise. The nest had been pillaged, all the eggs taken but one, which was still warm to the touch when she climbed up the tree to check. She searched the surrounding woods and finally spotted the parents huddled in a white spruce, mewing and trembling their wings and opening their bills to one another. Then the birds flew off. Louise caught glimpses of them at long intervals until they disappeared altogether. After 21 hours of watching, Louise concluded that the winter nesting Canada jays keep their eggs warm by both parents incubating together, stacked on the nest. The first time such behavior was observed. She sent her report to the National Museum along with carefully boxed nest with a carefully boxed nest containing the sole remaining egg, which was tested and found infertile. The nest and egg were added to the collections of the nation, where I should add, you can still see them. Two years later, five days with a pair of nesting Canada Jays appeared in the Canadian Field Naturalist, Louise's first published study. Her initiation into nest watching had taken her into almost virgin ornithological territory, rich with opportunities to make a contribution and alive with controversy. Was this a mated pair or sisters? at the nest. There were still so many questions to be answered. How could she resist? So that, uh, that drawing there that, that's visible um, is, is the drawing that Louise did to accompany the study that was published in the Canadian Field Naturalist. So the day in 1939, the day after the Second World War was declared, Louise eloped with uh, Len Lawrence, the man she'd hired to finish her cabin and build her furniture, and who had introduced her to the most common forest birds using local names, woodpicks for woodpeckers, camp robbers for Canada Jays. I should say, too, that um, her first husband, Gleb, uh, when Louise was in uh, Vaughanfield, she discovered the fate of her first husband. He had been taken out with 500 other white Russian officers and shot. Um, and she read this in a book in Dr. Defoe's uh, house. And uh, Dr. Defoe, who was famous as the doctor to the Quints. So she, I don't think she ever stopped grieving him for her whole life, but she did remarry um, in 1939. Len enlisted almost immediately. And for the next five years, Louise lived alone in the woods, which was a great gift to Louise in a way, and certainly a gift to ornithology, because she was suddenly released from the burden of earning a living. They'd been raising chickens, hundreds and hundreds of chickens. And now she had Len's army paycheck, and she was free to follow her passion, which was birds. Whoops, sorry. Now, none of the birds that Louise had known in Sweden appeared in the woods around her cabin on Pimacy Bay. Uh, Len had taught her the names of the common northern species, but the brightly colored birds that arrived in the spring to build their nests, these were a mystery. And little did she know that she had bought a piece of paper, a property that, that was extremely privileged. Where she is on the Matawa River represents the northern limit of southern breeding birds and the southern limit of northern breeding birds. So she got both types of birds on her little patch of land. One day in early May, a strange bird landed on her feeding table. She wrote to her mother, well, she wrote to her mother every Sunday for 40 years, letters that were five to six pages long, type single space, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters which were uh, an indispensable resource for this book. But she wrote to her mother in early May, quote, this bird was bright orange over the belly, breast and under the wings, which are black and white. There's gonna be a test. Not knowing his real name, I call him Jelly Belly, she wrote. Now, of course, Louise wasn't content with a name like Jelly Belly, even though the bird did look like it had been nesting in a bowl of orange marmalade. She was a nurse. She was used to calling things by their proper names, but who could she ask for the scientific names of birds? Not her neighbors who were farmers and trappers and tree fellers. She knew no one educated in the science of birds. 
But then a casual friend loaned her a copy of Birds of Canada by Percy Tavener. This was published in 1934, the first publication to attempt to list all the birds of Canada, their habits and their habitats. And on the left, that's Louise reading uh, the 1934 edition of Birds of Canada. Of course, it's too big to haul into the woods when you're you know, going after a bird. So she bought The Pocket Guides to Eastern North American Birds by Frank Chapman and Chester Reed. Um, and I forget which one this is. I think this might be the Chester. Yeah, I think that's the Chester Reed, uh, which is a lovely, lovely little book. You know, it's just about that big, really quite wonderful to take into the woods. And with those three books, her life took a turn. You should see me now, she wrote to her mother, running around the bush at every twitter of a strange bird at the flutter of wings, book in hand, to watch and decide what particular bird is nesting or flirting in our bushes and treetops. The jelly belly I wrote about last time is a Baltimore Oriole, which was quite a rare specimen in Northern Ontario at that time. So Taverner's introduction to Birds of Canada deeply touched Louise. If you have a chance to read it in the original edition, it really is, it is quite, it is really holds up. There was, he said, much valuable work to be done by every sort of watcher, physiologist, behaviorist, and amateur too. The amateur, he wrote, may record information of scientific as well as popular interest. Well, that really spoke to Louise. He gave it, it his words gave her purpose through the long war years of solitude. Blessed be these birds, she wrote to Taverner. With them, it is quite impossible to feel one instant of loneliness or boredom. And for those of you who um, you know, took advantage of bird watching what, through the epidemic, through the pandemic, um, you know, I, I think our relationship to birds has saved many of us in the same way that it, it saved Louise. But from the beginning, Louise was never entirely satisfied with just watching. She wrote to Taverner, I feel I need an aim. How can I do more, study better, let it come to use for all of our knowledge? Why not take up banding, he said. I don't think anyone can really know a bird until they've held it in their hand. And so for 17 years, from 1942 to 1959, Louise operated the most northerly banding station in Ontario and quite possibly in eastern North America. She found plans. She built herself a simple flat trap. And with trepidation, she caught her first bird, a blue jay. Over 17 years, she banded 2,628 individual birds representing 50 species. Few of her banded birds were found but they were invaluable to her studies, especially her nest watches, because she used colored bands to differentiate male from female, um, to differentiate different territories, different pairs of birds, lessons that she had learned to pay attention to during her first study with the Canada Jays. And banding, of course, taught her more, as those of you who've done it know, she, she, in order to catch a bird, she had to know what it ate, whether it was a tree creeper or a ground feeder, shy or curious, all of which determined which trap to use and how to bait it. There was so much she wanted to learn. Almost nothing was known, as I said, about many of the birds in her woods. Bird studying has such a scope, she wrote to Tavender, that I feel I have to limit myself somewhere. From the things I've read lately about different ways of learning about bird life, it seems that a well-conducted regional study over a period of years is yet a field that has been little explored. Oh, is, that, is some of that, some of that, I'm sorry. Oh, that slide is a bit not good. I apologize for that. Um, you can see the map above my head. So this is she mapped all her property according to where species nested, but uh, she, uh, so she had individual maps for different species. At one point, she had 65 different nests under observation. Here, this is a red-eyed vireo map, and, and this is her, her property. This is Pimacy Bay on the right, and then that angle across, across the top is the Mattawa, the Mattawa River going up to Talon Chutes, where it begins. But 
the large oval represents her um, the territory of one pair of, of red-eyed vireos. But you'll notice that inside each large oval, there are two other ovals, a little one and a bigger one. The little one is the nesting area, and the larger one is, is, the, um, is the song area. Um, and I'll be talking more about that in, in a minute. So the, Luisa's second scientific article was a comparative study of the nesting behavior of chestnut-sided and Nashville warblers. It was published in the AUK the official publication, as you know, of the American Society of Ornithologists, to which she'd been elected as a member. So this, this was a huge leap forward to be published in New York. Uh, later on, she was published in all of the large, prestigious ornithological journals. What intrigued Louise about these two warbler species, and these are both her drawings, was the difference between their nests. The Nashville, uh, on the left, built directly on the ground, shaping its nest from little roots and fine fibers and hiding it under a thatch of dead leaves. And the coloring of the Nashville female, as you know, is so like the forest floor that Louise had a hard time seeing her. The chestnut sided, on the other hand, hung her nest about half a meter off the ground using fine grasses and strips of bark, birch bark, that created a perfect camouflage in the dappled light of the understory. And if you've seen these two nests, you know exactly what she means. She observed the best, the, the birds through nest building, incubation, hatching until the baby birds fledged and left the nest. One of the things that I found really fascinating in her study is that she noticed that the Nashville warbler always faced south when she sat on her eggs. She always headed east when she left the nest. And regardless of where she flew in the meantime, she always returned from the east. So definitely creatures of habit. Um, one, of, one of Louise's favorite birds was the red-eyed vireo. She began making notes on the red-eye in 1940, shortly after she started watching birds. She did a short nesting study in 1945. And in 1949, she decided to concentrate on that species. At the time of her study, the, the common wisdom was that both parents incubated the eggs. This really intrigued Louise. But over the course of several years, she'd watched nine red Iberio nests, more than 100 hours of observations, and she'd never yet seen a male on the nest. The pattern she observed was always the same. When the female settled on her eggs, the male would withdraw. He'd travel alone through his song area, singing and feeding, Meanwhile, his mate would sit in stillness on her nest, on the nesting area. Suddenly, the male would stop singing, and the female would perk up, hop to the rim of the nest, and fly to her mate in his song area where he'd feed her. So the red eye song, she concluded, was not a musical overindulgence, as some people said, uh, some sort of virtuoso performance. His constant chirwit, chiri, chirwit, was a way of staying in touch with his mate, sort of like a string of text saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. The most famous study she ever undertook was in 1953 when she did a dawn to dust birdsong count of the vireo. It sang for six minutes shy of 14 hours. Altogether, it sang 22,197 songs. So that's during one day, dawn to dusk. Um, and that record, of course, has never been broken, either by a watcher <laughs> or, by a, or, or by a bird. Um, so Louise went on to publish, uh, oops, sorry, the first comprehensive study of the red-eyed vireo, a 30-page study, just absolutely amazing, uh, to write this book. I found all of her studies, all of her articles, um, popular and scientific. Um, and because it was done during COVID, everything had to be sent to me digitally and then printed out, which was not quite the same as reading it in archives in the original. But Louise was the first to record that red-eyed vireo males have a song area and females have a nest area. She was the first to observe the courtship behavior, that courtship feeding of, of the pair and the first to identify and transcribe the red-eyed vireo songs. 
she believed that bird song was language. Now, that's a really common idea now, but it was revolutionary at the time. Um, it was thought that birds song, you know, birds sang for the joy of it. She recorded bird song for dozens of species, transcribing them into a really unique written form. Like most of us, Louise came to birds through their through their music. The, the dong chorus, the simple fluting of a wood thrush. I hope you guys still have some wood thrushes in your, in your bush. The hilarious imitation of a catbird. We saw a catbird last Saturday at the Charco here where, where we go every week to watch birds. The songs of the warblers especially delighted her, but already in her first years of watching in the early 1940s, she noticed their numbers were in decline. She decided to chart the population of 13 species of warblers to determine if, if her, you know, if, if, if her general observations were correct. And indeed, in the decade from 1941 to 1952, the population of all warbler species dropped by more than 10%. But what is stunning is that the chestnut side of the morning warbler and Canada warblers dropped by 75%. She suspected the depopulation was linked to roadside spraying because they just started spraying the roadsides with chemicals, uh, mostly DDT. So she set out to prove that link. So she uh, designated a half mile section of a hydro right away. And she recorded the songbird population before and after spraying. And initially, the area was home to five pairs of yellow throats, four pairs of indigo buntings, two pairs of morning warblers, and one pair of song sparrows. The area was sprayed twice over the summer, the second time really heavily. After spraying, she went back several times. She never counted more than one pair of yellow throats and a single male indigo bunting. No morning warblers, no song sparrows. She checked other roadsides and hydro cuts that weren't being sprayed, and there the birds were in their usual abundance. She published her results in the Federation of Ontario Naturalists Bulletin and suggested ways of controlling unwanted plant growth uh, without using chemical sprays. But of course, as we know, the spraying continued. Two years later, in 1954, so that's almost 70 years ago, she wrote on the subject again, this time you can feel her rage. Shall there be no nook or corner in our environment which we may leave untainted and unpolluted by our artificial necessities? She was absolutely furious. A decade later, when Rachel Carson took up the same challenge to prove that link between chemical use and bird population decline, she used data from an army of amateur watchers like Louise and like Roy Ivor in uh, Mississauga, who'd been recording that decline for years. Louise sent her data not only to the ornithologists in Ottawa and at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, but she also shared it, as did many Canadian amateurs, with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's where Rachel Carson gleaned the data for her statistics. So it's more than likely that Rachel Carson added Louise's numbers to prove her argument that toxic chemicals were causing the degradation of the environment and killing birds. And of course, we all know that since 1970, another 3 billion birds have been lost. But we sometimes forget that that 3 billion is only since 1970. It's on top of the millions lost in the three decades before, when only amateurs like Louise were counting the declines in their forests. It's, uh, it's just too huge to even contemplate. We can now, of course, lay most of the blame for that decline of songbirds at the feet of us, humans, our polluting ways, our greed for urban land. But Louise was still puzzled by what she saw. For Louise, it was always the unanswered questions that intrigued her. Why did chickadees sing so lustily in January, which was far in advance of their breeding season? Why did small birds nest within sight of merlins? Merlins are their, one of their most deadly predators. What was the reproduction cycle of red crossbills and the life history of the yellow-bellied sapsucker? Wilderness birds about which nothing was known. And what was a northern flicker saying exactly when it thrust its bill into the air and moved its head side to side? 
Louise was really fascinated by species-specific rituals that birds have developed over their 150 million years on Earth compared to our 10,000. So in her monograph, which is there on the slide right now, in her monograph on four species of woodpeckers, but by the way, is still cited on Cornell's All About Birds website, she tracked the flicker's ritualized way of dealing with social aggression. And she called their solution harmonious association. So this slide shows the aggressive social display of the flicker. Uh, above is a low intensity display where birds face each other. They point their bills in little circles or figure eights, their tails spread and sort of half twisted. As, as the challenge intensifies below uh, is a high intensity display where the birds face each other directly. Uh, they bob, their wings are fully open, their tail is fully spread so that the pale underside of the feathers and the yellow shafts are fully visible. You know, in, it's, it's kind of a glaring whiteness. And in the final stage of a standoff, you may have seen this, the two birds will take off through the woods in opposite directions, zipping among the trees, burning off their aggression instead of reaching for a gun the way some of us do. So. I, I really love her notion of harmonious association and wish she'd written more about it and hope that we can sort of cotton on to that. But for, you know, for a ma an amateur, there was no money in scientific studies, only if you were, you know, a paid professor somewhere. So to support herself, Louise wrote popular articles based on what she had learned through her scientific observations. She became a regular contributor to a dozen different magazines, including Nature and Audubon. In fact, she is still remains the most prolific contributor in the history of Audubon magazine. And she furthermore, she taught herself to draw in order to illustrate her articles and thus, you know, earn a little more money. At the same time, she was shaping those observations into narratives that became books. The Log House Nest in 1945, The Lovely in the Wild, there on the far left, which won the John Burroughs Medal, which is the, the highest prize for nature writing in North America. She was, Louise was the first Canadian woman to win the prize and only the fourth women, woman since it was instituted in the late 19th century. Rachel Carson won it in 1965 for Silent Spring and Louise won it in 1969 for this memoir of living with birds. Louise continued to write all through her 80s. Uh, when she was 83, she published the story of her Russian love, Another Winter, Another Spring. And she published her last book at the age of 86, To Whom the Wilderness Speaks. The year she turned 90, she published her last scientific article, um, a really poignant description of the mating cycle of the downy woodpecker that was published in Living Bird Quarterly. And the following year, when she was 91, she published her last story with Audubon, what she called her swan song. Altogether, she published six books and almost 100 articles for scientific journals and popular magazines. It's just an astonished lifetime contribution especially considering she only started at the age of 50. I guess she had to live to be almost 100. Well into her 90s, uh, Louise continued her daily bird walk at dawn, keeping notes on arrival and departure dates and nesting and migration, all the behaviors that fascinated her. I know of no occupation so fulfilling as that of becoming a watcher, she wrote in The Lovely in the Wild. The observing self is pushed into the background and obliterated except for a cramped leg or an aching muscle imposed by forced immobility. All the senses are focused on the amazing events that are constantly taking place. And I know all of you who are avid bird watchers know exactly what she means by that. So I knew Louise when we were both lived in our separate patches of woods near North Bay in the 1980s. The last time we were together at her log house, we stood looking at the big windows with their view through the trees at Pemacy Bay. And she said to me, you can't imagine how it feels to have one question after another solved about how birds lived. When I think about it now, 
I realized what a mammoth job it was. It's a pity I couldn't finish it. The structure on the left is obviously her log house, and on the right is a portrait of her taken in 1989 when she was 95. I was 40 at the time, and I wrote a profile of Louise for Harrowsmith Magazine. She liked it so much, she asked me to be her biographer, and I said yes, which is the way I've lived most of my life, not really knowing what I was signing up for. I, I had never really read bio biographies. I didn't really like biographies. I had no idea how to do it. So Louise died in 1992, 30 years ago last spring. And all through those decades, I pondered how on earth I was going to fulfill my promise to her. If I was going to write about Louise, I wanted the reader to get to know her the way I did through her own voice. So luckily, I had all those letters and all those published studies where, where her voice was, was very much apparent. As I sorted through all that material, I realized I wanted to share the process of the book with the reader. I wanted to the, sh the bones of biography to show. I wanted to take the reader into the reading room of the Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa, and, and there it is on the upper right. I wanted to take them into the bird vaults at, at the ROM, where I was surrounded by cabinets filled with 140,000 dead birds. And on the left, you can see a nest and a, and a bird that Louise donated to the ROM. And in the middle, uh, what, the, what the, the shelves of the, of the cabinets look like. I want to share the ethical dilemma of telling the life history of someone I knew only at the end of her life. The discomfort I felt in, in prying into those private nooks that no one ever saw except maybe her mother. And I even discovered a couple that her mother didn't see. So I, I came to view the book as part memoir, a memoir of the writing of the book, but also a memoir of my own life with birds, which is a very, very slender thread through the book. I didn't want it to dominate. But like Louise, I've been watching birds since I was a little girl. It wasn't until 10 years ago when I started living half the year here in central Mexico in the mountains in the wintering grounds of a lot of the songbirds that we see in the spring that I became intensely aware of the birds' migrations and what that meant to them. And of my own migrations from north to south now and as a child when I lived in Brazil and of Louise's migrations through her life to Sweden, to Canada and back and and what that might have meant to her. So finally, I could see my way to writing the life of this amazing woman who was such an inspiration to me through stories lifted from her letters and her speeches and her research studies told in her words, the birds of my childhood and, and the birds of the South interfeathered with her birds from the North and the entire process visible from beginning to end. And where this story ends, is with me living in her log house to write the final chapters uh, of the book. You can see there her fireplace. The inside of the house looks exactly as it did, uh, you know, in the 80s when I used to visit her there, except that now her table is covered with, my, with the chapters of my book as I'm trying to get them into some kind of shape. I walked the paths that she walked. I, I canoed, uh, uh, you know, in the mornings up to Talon shoots. Um, I paused, took in the same views. I noted she, I dug out her list of the last um, departure date for birds in the fall. So I noted the birds that were passing through on their way south, those that remained and those that flew through and the few that were still around, including, I have to say, I finally saw on my last day there a red-eyed vireo, which made me very, very happy. I noted all that was different and so much that was still the same. So I want to thank you for listening. I, I really encourage you to go to my website so that you can hear Louise's voice. Uh, my granddaughter, Astrid Moore, made a doc. She's a filmmaker and she made a documentary of Louise. And my son, who's a, um, a sound designer for film, he took my old interview tapes from the Harold Smith uh, interviews and, and he uh, cleaned them up so that you can hear her voice. And it's, it's really quite a lovely film. So if you go to my website on the right, you'll see a, the 
the book cover, click on that. You'll go to the woman watching page. And on the left side, you'll see the film. So now I will be very happy to answer your questions. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, I'm happy to answer any kind of questions, how I came to write the book um, about living in her log cabin, about what I'm working on now, about her, about knowing her, about how I met her, about anything. So I'm absolutely uh, at your service now. Thank so if you have much, any questions. Marilyn. This is Ken back here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's question time. Now, I put a little note in the chat there. If, if people want to put their question in the chat, we'll get to them as many as we can and read them out to Marilyn. But if you want to ask your question in person, um, there's a little lot on the bottom. You'll see something under um, the reactions, I think, where you can raise your hand. And um, yeah, it's under reactions. You can raise your hand. I'll see it. And then we can turn the, turn the mic over to you. But um, uh, one question's pop up. Uh, what's happened to the cabin? What's its present? Oh, this is a sad story. <laughs> Uh, so I had the opportunity to buy the cabin in, in 2015, and I was very excited by that. My, my dream was to occupy it for a while for myself and then leave it to Nature Conservancy or, or the Ontario government um, as a writing retreat for nature writers. Um, the woman who owned it at the time, and she was only the second owner since Louise died, uh, she was she was going through a separation and uh, she she sort of went back and forth as to whether she should sell the cabin um, because it was sort of a broken dream for them. And so she went back and forth. I thought we had a deal. It was uh, $235,000 and it was more than I could afford, but that was I figured I could manage it somehow. And uh, and then she wrote to me in Mexico and said, no, the deal is off. Uh, about six months later, she did sell it to the people who own uh, the Red and White in Rutherglen, and they have kept it since then. And, and actually, uh, the Craig, um, he knew Louise as a boy. He used to come and shovel her, her paths for her and bring groceries and things. He knew her, and so they were very, very respectful of her place and her legacy. Um, but it is now for sale again, and it's for sale for eight hundred thousand dollars. So I feel like my window has really, <laughs> my window has closed. Um, every time I speak to an Ontario group, they they lament uh, not this property not being, um, you know, in 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 public ownership. And I certainly agree. I'm not able to spearhead a drive to do that. Um, and it turns out to be extremely complicated. Um, the the township of oh dear, what count? Oh dear, it starts with a C. Anyway, the township that it's in, which I can't quite remember the name of right now. Uh, that township, the best that we could probably do is for the township to designate it as an important heritage property, and for that to happen, we would have to get a lot of people on side and and especially the Gagnons. And so I, anyway, again, this would take somebody other than myself um, to spearhead this, unfortunately. So uh, you, you cannot miss a, it. Do you know if there's a land trust in that area or any land trust have ever looked at it? Um, I don't know, but yeah. you know, it, it would, it's it, the property, you know, waterfront property is so expensive now that it's, uh, in general, land trusts don't buy things. They accept responsibility for donated properties. And um, I don't think that's an option right now. Okay. Um, so. Just a few more questions have popped up, but I just want to tell you when we're done with the questions, uh, hang around. We've got a few more other little trees to share with you. But there's a question here from Chris Evans, and um, it kind of, you know, uh, you've given us a nice feeling for the book, but don't think that you've uh, you've got everything. That you know, <laughs> Marilyn has only dipped her toe in the book. There's so much in this book, 
that you're just going to all have to read it. That's all there is to it. And, well, thank you, Ken. Uh, Chris is a uh, <laughs> Because the book, there's so much. What he, Chris is saying, what happened to her second husband, Lynn? And that's what, this book is so many things. It's the bird story. It's the Dion quintuplets. It's the Russian Revolution. It's also, well, I, it's also a wonderful love story. And yes. uh, tell us about Lynn. Well, yes, I, I, you know, I often say that that Louise lives five lives to to our, you know, our usual one. Um, it, it was it was hard to write a book in a way. Um, that incorporated it all without, you know, e any one dominated the other. Although for me, the birds dominated, and and Len was a really big part of that. Len Len was Northern Ontario, born and bred. Um, he made a living the way a lot of people in the North do. You know, he drove snowplow in winter. He graded the roads in summer. He he saw himself as the amanuensis for Louise. He was the one who made her work possible. So he did a lot of the cooking. He, 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 he created time for her and time. When you get to the stage that I'm at, time is the most precious thing you, you could possibly have. Um, and he, he loved her just, you know, beyond all reason. And, uh, and she loved him. They had, they had an amazing relationship and, one of the things I reproduce in the book is the letter that she, oh, I'm tearful just thinking about this, the, the letter that she wrote to him to keep in his pocket while he was overseas. And that letter is now in archives and, and it is folded into a small pocket-sized square. And it, it has clearly been opened and folded and opened and folded so many times that when you open it now, it 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 almost falls apart at all of the seams and it's it's grubby you know with whatever happened over there to him but what she says in that letter i reproduced the letter in full what she says in that letter i think is a model for any relationship um he uh he he suffered at the end and she suffered because of that and his end determined her end, and I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's a heartbreaking story in many ways, and uh, and also an inspiring story. Um, Virginia wants to know how you met Louise. Oh yes, well I, so I was living in Northern Ontario. I'd always I'd always written, you know, all through high school. I guess my sisters tell me I was a storyteller. I was born a storyteller. I was storytelling from the time I could talk. I used to entertain the rest of my sisters with stories. Um, and when I got to, I, I settled on a, a 15, a 50 acre piece of land uh, near Asterville. So I was, uh, you know, on the, on the Western end of Lake Nosbensing and, and Bonfield and rather Glen are on the, the Eastern end of Lake Nosbensing. And, and our properties are, are, are pretty much, you know, a bird can kind of pretty much fly canopy to canopy uh, between our houses. In fact, they did. And I'll tell you that story in a minute, but um, I was working on my first book and there were very few writers up there, like nobody. And I heard about a book launch at North Bay Public Library um, by a woman named Louise de Caroline Lawrence. And I went, and that was the book launch for um, To Whom the Wilderness Speaks in 1980. And uh, I went and I met her and we just kind of clicked. And so I started visiting her um, at her log house. And when I was researching this, uh, you know, I had to read all her letters, of course, thousands. And in one of her letters, she says, oh, I saw the most amazing bird today. It was an evening grosbeak. I mean, now I know it was a leucistic evening grosbeak. It was completely yellow, like a big canary. And I thought, oh, my God, I saw that bird. And so I went to my diaries. I've always kept a diary. I went to the diary for that year, same day. And I looked and I saw that bird on my feet or on that same day. And so that's how this book begins is our two feeders you know, uh, a dis, you know, as the bird flies, probably 15, 20 minutes away from each other. Um, and yet we had this connection both through birds and through words. Um, 
and 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 it was a rare and really precious connection for me. Speaking about connections, I shared this with Marilyn earlier, but that that all yellow evening grow speak. Many of you that follow the local press will know that we had a, a identical bird appear at some of our feeders <laughs> here in Midland uh, back in November. And oh, that's it. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. I mean, it it's it's just so shocking. And I the other amazing bird I saw up there was was a pure white robin. And I I I had just been birding with um Roger Tory Peterson the November before. And so I immediately called him up. You know, this was the days before email. I called him up and I said, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, it looks just like a robin, but it's all white. He said, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because he'd seen <laughs> lots of lots of leucistic birds in his lifetime, but uh, it was it was really astonishing to me, and I don't think I would have believed either one of those if I hadn't, you know, had some guidance. Which is how we used to learn about birds, and I guess we still do to a large extent, is from books and from other birders. But think about Louise in her woods. Very few books, no other birders. Uh, she learned entirely on her own, which that alone to me is quite astonishing. But I'm amazed in your book, too, about all the famous or the leading beard experts that she would just yeah. reach out to. I know. And make these intimate connections with. And we, maybe we don't do that enough. I mean, we all have our circle, our friends. But I'm amazed sometimes when I recruit speakers for this. I, I'm, you know, I don't think I've ever been turned down. Uh, if you love birds yeah. and the people you're speaking to love birds. There's a connection. and uh... That's right. You want to share. And she was fearless. I mean, if, if she thought somebody had an answer, then she would just connect with them. She would just write them a letter. And in those days, she didn't even have a telephone for the first 25 years in the cabin. She had no telephone, no electricity, um, no running water. Uh, she dipped water from the lake and she, you know, cut wood to heat her her, her fireplace and, and wrote by candlelight and, and uh, kerosene lamp. And 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 so she wrote letters and thank goodness she did. I could never have written this book. I don't think I could have written this book if it happened now. Yeah, because I'm not people sure don't write letters. It's going to be easier for now that we're in the age of email. No, it's going to be much worse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I knew some of the names coming here, but by, I discovered one guy I didn't know, uh, Robert Nero, who. Uh, oh, yeah. Responded. Yeah. And I don't know whether you know, but he just passed away in January at the age of 105. Here, yes. Yeah. Isn't isn't that shocking? And what's when I was and doing Robert this. Robert Nero was maybe the world's leading expert on great gray owls. And, uh, right. But he was also not only a birder, a poet. And it sounds like an amazing man as well. Yes. And he actually yes, wrote a, a book about Louise uh, uh, called Woman at the Shore, um, which was a series of poems he he wrote about her and, and her work. And what, what really interested me in, you know, reading about all these other ornithologists, the book has a lot of information about other amateur um, ornithologists because she was not alone. And she would be the first to tell you that she was completely without pretense or, you know, that ambition or ego. She, she knew she was one of, of many amateurs and most of them lived to a hundred or their late 90s. It's amazing. So, you know, I think it's all this walking in the woods that's going to stand us in very good, in very good stead. Yeah, there, there's kind of a group of female friends that she had that, that were all involved too. And the number that's of right. that were involved in this early ornithology is amazing. Yeah, there, there's a whole chapter on women in ornithology. So, you know, she stepped into this legacy kind of unknowingly. But, you know, for 200 years before her, there had been these amazing women ornithologists. You know, the first the first uh, the first bird manual was was by uh, was by a woman, Florence Miriam Bailey. And, and with opera uh, glasses. that's right. And, and yeah. then Mabel, Mabel Osgood. And I mean, it was just one after another women. Um, they changed bird watching from a mostly a sport where you killed your bird in order to identify it to an activity that 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 was taking place at a distance as as little as possible without disturbing the birds and one of the things they did is they wrote prolifically 
And so they, they, they promoted narratives about birding so that the birds became available to anyone who could read. And, and that, that was a huge contribution. I, I loved writing that chapter. I learned, I learned about all kinds of people I never knew existed. So get your questions in quickly, because we're probably going to wrap things up fairly soon. Yeah, uh, it's about four minutes, I think. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but again, I just want to thank Marilyn and, you know, go out and read the book. Uh, Louise, uh, uh, one of her books, Mar, was one of the first books our book club ever read in our list. Oh, of really? Books. Oh, yeah. wow. Amazing. So we did read that one, but, and I'm not sure how many of Louise's books are still in print, but is there one in particular you direct people to, to discover her writing? You know, I, I think To Whom the Wilderness Speaks is a really good place to start. This is a, a collection of her Audubon articles over 40 years. And, and I, I think it gives a really, uh, you know, she talks about a lot of different species. It gives an introduction to her, to the, you know, the studies that she did, but also to her philosophy. She talks a lot about her philosophy and the writing really, really stands, stands up. Now, I think that one you can still find. Um, some of these paperbacks are still available. And some of them are available as eBooks. The one that isn't available at all is The Lovely in the Wild, which is her most famous book and is really, you should, if you can get it, you should. And the one place you can get it is through Abe Books, A-B-E Books. And that's, that's a, an agglomeration of used booksellers. And I find that there are a lot of her uh, first edition books, hardcovers are available through that. I ended up buying two copies of each first edition, one to mark up and one to keep pristine so I could we have you know, a, see We it. have a member of our club who's on the called Paul Rawlinson who deals and use books. Paul, if, oh, you've great. Got, if you've got a copy of that book for sale, let us know in the chat. And also before everybody leaves, the chat's a good place to give uh, Marilyn a bit of feedback. So uh, thank you. You know, uh, give her a few comments in the chat there, and we'll share that with Marilyn. Um, that would be wonderful because I have lost my visual. I I can't no. see anything, and I usually collect the chat. And so, if somebody else could do that for me, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that for you. So with um, that, Ken, I just, oh, Ken it's Dorothy. Um, Dorothy. I'm just on ahead. audio, so I can't can't use chat. So I have one quick question, and Marilyn, yes, we I'm one of the book club members who read your book and we thoroughly enjoyed oh, it good. um a question about that property um do you know how many how much property there is with the cabin yes it's just over three acres hmm because the ontario nature uh has nature reserves it might be something they would be interested in and you know we have 150,000 members um you know and i, I think it's 150 groups you know, they pay wow. 1.1 million for a tiny slice, so few acres. So maybe can you give Ken the contact information? I I can. Um, to or, or, yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. Is there, is there a realtor that's dealing with it now, or I don't know? Um, I there? actually don't know. You could probably find out, but Ken, yeah. you and I can have an email correspondence about this. That's a really good idea. Ontario Nature is good at raising money if they set their mind to it. Well, yeah. this. Nothing could be more of a legacy than this property. I mean, it, and I should tell you quickly, too, that uh, there is a biologist from the University of Guelph who is um, digitizing Louise's data. I mean, she has data for 50 years, right, on that piece of property. And what he wants to do is to use that data and do a contemporary study and see what's changed, right? And you get very, very few pieces of property where you can do that sort of thing. So I think it has great scientific as well as literary value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a few acres for 800,000, that sounds like peanuts compared to what Ontario Nature has bought before, so. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's very yeah. exciting. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. of project, book, project Bookmark will definitely want to put up a plaque there, right? Yes. <laughs> so um, the uh, you know uh, Marilyn gave us a um, a couple of uh, Louise's books to look up. You're all going to read Woman Watching. That's a given. But uh, <laughs> I have to. If there's another book of Marilyn's that you should read, I just finished her novel she did just before Woman Watching. It's called Refuge, and and I thought 
uh, Marilyn told, told me I was off base, but I thought there was a lot of Louise <laughs> in that book as well, but apparently not. Is that right, Marilyn? Um, that's that's right. It's it, it's funny because it is about an, an older woman living by herself. She's not a bird watcher or anything like that. Um, but she does. And, she's a watcher. She's, she's an observer. She is an observer. She is. And and the interesting thing is that several people have written to me and said, oh, wow, this is Louise, isn't it? Like after that book came out and before I wrote this one. And honest, you know, I swear I did not have Louise in my mind for even half a second when I wrote that book. But I will admit that I have a thing for older women. I'm an older woman now. So honestly, I've got, I've got to keep finding older and older and older women. And one of my closest friends right now is 102. So yay, there's still some around. But I do. I really love older women. I, I, I'm fascinated by how, how older women live their lives and, and especially how they come to the end of their lives. And so, yeah. So I, I think that accounts for this. The refuge takes place in Canada, um, starts out on an island in central Ontario, where this 96-year-old woman named Cassandra McCallum is, is living out her last years. And it, it the book roams from Montreal, New York City, Mexico City, and Burma. So it it's it's a bit of an international story of, you know, um, who do we give refuge to? And 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 who gives refuge? It's apparently, uh, apparently yeah. you told me that there was another old woman that it is based on. So there's a lot of yeah. These wonderful old women. Oh, there's a lot of these great old ladies around. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, luck uh, will all become one. <laughs> President Bob Codd here has raised his hand. You got to unmute yourself, Bob. And uh, is it a question for Marilyn? Uh, it's not a question. I just I just wanted to thank Marilyn for sharing this with us. I'm, I, I I hadn't read the book and I never heard the story and I've never heard of the subject, but I got to say that I was really, really moved by your obvious passion. And oh, I, thank you. Thank you. A few moments. Well, I, I really want to thank you for, for sharing this with us. It, it, it was wonderful. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm going to leave now. It's my granddaughter's last day in town and I promised I would, I would take her out for dinner. So I'm off. Okay. And it's, <laughs> It's only uh, seven o'clock there or something. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, okay, well, thank uh, you very much. Really and uh, uh, put your comments for Marilyn in the chat. Bye-bye, Marilyn. We'll talk thank to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And uh, we have uh, a couple other little things to share before uh, we all leave. Uh, there's another, I won't call her an older lady, but uh, uh, one of our members, Mary Rajapaksi, um, is our, uh, we call her our Arizona correspondent. She's down in Arizona right now. She sent us a bunch of her pictures I'm sure you want to see. Before we do that, have you got anything else to say, say Bob, before we sign, kind of sign off and say goodnight? No, I think I think this is a perfect close for the for the meeting. Thanks for coming, everyone. Okay, now. we'll go over and look at Mary's pictures and then we'll say goodnight. So I'm gonna take off Bob's pin. Give me a second to share my screen. Everybody seeing that okay? How does it look? Bob? It's good to be, Ken. Okay. So this these are this is the report from our Arizona correspondent, Mary Rajapaksi. She's down there seeing lots of birds that we don't get to see. And first one of the, some of the ducks, this is a cinnamon teal. Now it's not, it's kind of their version of our blue wing teal, but we don't get to see these. They pretty well stay out west. And that's a beautiful red male cinnamon teal. Excuse me, Ken, maybe you could go full screen with this? I think I'm as full screen as it gets. Okay. Uh, that, that probably depends on what Mary sends me. No, that's probably a little better, eh? Yeah, a little better. Yeah, and then uh, we, of course we get these, but they are one of the most beautiful birds in the world, the wood duck. Uh, the one of the most poorly named ducks in the world, the ring neck duck. Uh, you can never see the ring on the neck, or you only see the ring on the bill. Canvas backs. Um, these some people call this the. Um, uh, it's been called the aristocrat of ducks. 
Now this is a female, but uh, the males are a little more spectacular. Green winged teals, we've had a pair of these hanging around uh, Penetang Harbor all winter. And uh, this is where Mary sees a lot of her birds at the Bubbling Pods Fish Hatchery down in Arizona. And now uh, this is Mary's uh, spirit bird. She has a, seems to have a personal connection with bald eagles. They follow her everywhere and she just loves them. So we've got lots of pictures of bald eagles. But she also gets these down there. Now the common black hawk, it's rare in the States. You have pretty well have to go to Southern Arizona or New Mexico to see them, but they're a little more common in Mexico. And a beautiful hawk that it, it acts a lot like an osprey. It kind of hunts over the water. The common black hawk. You can see the little uh, white on the tail there. And it, it's nice that these uh, places in Arizona, they have signs that point you to where the birds are. We should have those up here in Tiny Marsh. You know, black turns this way or something. And there's Mary and that's, uh, she's at the base of the tree. You can see the black hawk up at the top of the tree there. Red-tailed hawk that we get. Wilson snipe, of course, they're common up here in the summer. And she was quite pleased to find this Western screech owl. Now, a Western screech owl looks almost identical to our Eastern screech owl, but they're different species. And mostly you tell them apart with their sound. The Western screech owl has what they call the bouncing ball call. It kind of goes um, uh, loud, loud beeps going, starting slow and going fast. Beep, 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 like a bouncing ball getting faster and faster. The Western screech owl. And uh, a, she's seen a couple of great horned owls down there. This one was flirting with her. You can see it winking there. There's the great horned owl. And uh, Mary, Mary intentionally blurred this photo. That, that's the pair of great horned owls mating. So we had to blur that one out a bit. And there's the great horned owl up in its tree. This is a spectacular bird she saw down there, the acorn woodpecker. Now, acorn woodpeckers like uh, Canada jays, they, they're called acorn because they'll take acorns and stash them in trees all over the woods. Uh, but you know, the gray jay has to remember where he stashed all his in various, but the acorn woodpeckers, um, they use what they call a granary tree. They'll take one tree, bore little holes, and they might put 50,000 acorns in that one, one, uh, one tree. So they, they don't mind putting all their acorns into one basket, I guess. The acorn woodpecker. Spectacular little bird. The ladderback woodpecker. Um, at one time, it was called the cactus woodpecker. Uh, it's a woodpecker that will actually live in places that really don't have many trees, just cactuses and things. American kestrel we get here. This is a vermilion flycatcher. Now, I think this is probably the uh, the mature male is a brilliant red. I think this is an immature male. It's just starting to go red in various spots. Says Phoebe, like our own Eastern Phoebe, it's a tail pumper. But um, this one actually is the breeds farther north than any... Um, well, it breeds all over the West, but it also breeds up into Alaska. And some people feel that it's been following the Alaska pipeline because it likes to breed on human structures and it breeds right on the on the on the pipes of the pipeline. And as the pipeline goes further north, they, I think the people figure the Says Phoebe followed it. Uh, the Black Phoebe, again, a bird you have to go to the Southwest states or California to see. This little bird is a bridal titmouse. Now it's in the same family as chickadees. And they have them down there in Arizona, New Mexico, and in Mexico. Hermit thrushes, like, like the ones we get up here with his nice red tail. And this is the Western bluebird. We get Eastern bluebirds. Bob's bu busy building boxes for them. Uh, the, the Western bluebird, I guess it has a different song, but where the um, Eastern bluebird would have red going up into the throat the Western bluebird is all blue in the throat. This one, uh, Mary said, was anting in front of her, kind of uh, letting the ants kind of clean its feathers. A couple of the female Western bluebirds. American pipits. Now, they, uh, we get pipits in North America. We, we mostly, they breed way up in the Arctic, and then they go south to the tropics. So we see them in migration. Probably we'll start seeing some soon. I've got a couple of twoies here, and some people, there was, 
The Canyon Tui was once called the Brown Tui, but the Canyon Tui and the California Tui were split. California Tui would uh, look pretty well identical, but just be in a different area. And the Alberts Tui is also closely related. I, I say Tui should be Tawi. There's the Alberts Tawi again. And the spotted Tawi is very similar to our Eastern Tawi. It has a few more spots on its wings and its back. Mary saw a bunch of chipping sparrows down there, white crown sparrow, and the juncos. Now, there's mostly uh, juncos all over North America, all as a species. They're the um, uh, dark eyed junco, but there's different colorings of them. This coloring is called the gray headed junco. They are the same species as the juncos we get, but this is the Oregon junco with a nice black head. Evening grosbeaks, we've had some of these around uh, Midland this winter, which is nice. Mary had a bunch of them down there in Arizona. And this spectacular bird is the lazuli bunting. It's kind of the, I guess, the Western version of our indigo bunting. Lazuli, um, it's named after the lapis lazuli, that, uh, which is a gemstone. Lapis means stone and lazuli means sky blue. Lazuli bunting. And the Cassin's finch, very similar to our house or purple finch, has a little more of a tufted crest and a little different shape to the bill. And again, a Western bird. There's the house finch in comparison. She did get some mammals down there and of course some spectacular scenery down there in Arizona. A couple of friends from Midland joined her. Maybe you recognize them. Some of the vegetation. There's Mary standing in front of an old cottonwood tree. And she did join up with she, Mary knows that there's nothing to feel in fear in birding groups. She joined some Audubon bird groups down there to help see a few more birds. And she just sent me this picture today. Uh, her birding has been cut short. There's a lot of flooding down there right now as the snow cap melts. Uh, so it's kind of closed off and some people are being evacuated. So here's some of Mary's videos she sent us. Those are the green winged teal. A whole field of American widgeon. One of these snipe manages to pull out a nice meal. You'll see that coming up in a second. Here's the early bird here. We got that nice long worm. And there's the acorn woodpecker, very clownish. And we'll finish off with lots of bald eagles. Again, Mary's, I think Mary's favorite bird.
So I'm back. Uh, we still got a few people here, but I think that's the end of the show. So thank you everybody for coming. And I say next month, uh, we've got a great presenter coming who's also an author. Um, see if I've got the book handy here. Uh, this is the book that she's going to, that she's written. Can I get it on camera here? The Flora of Kawartha Lakes. And she'll probably have some of these for sale. And it's amazing. It's kind of like, it's kind of a field guide to the flora. And of course, the flora of Kawartha Lakes is not unlike our own flora, but it's the most readable field, field guide I've ever, ever gone through it. There's a lot of great information on it, not just about flowers, but about geology and about nature in general. So uh, Dale Ledbeater, who's worked on this book for 10 years with a lot of volunteers over there, is going to come and tell us all about it. It should be a great meeting, and we'll be back in person. It'll be fun. Thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>